Goat Hill, resting on the Danvers and Bass Rivers, has a unique place in the history of Beverly. A place of many different working families, the hill is close to the harbor, the railroad, factories, and businesses, yet removed from the bustle and traffic of Rentoul Street. Jake and Marguerite Condon have lived here for over half a century. Residing on Wellman Street, surrounded by friends and families, they have been an important part of the fabric of both the Hill and the Beverly community. Jake, how did an Irishman from Salem end up here on Goat Hill? Well, I used to come over in a rowboat and have dates with my wife and the Goat Hill Playground before that wall was built. There was just a, a long sloping lawn there. Probably one of the few guys that made dates with, uh, in a rowboat. Of course, in those days, not many people had cars. That was 51 years ago. Where did you uh, grow up in Salem? I grew up in North Salem. I grew up, first we lived on Franklin Street where that automobile junkyard is. Now it's a beautiful park when we first moved there. There was no junkyards. It was a uh, Riverside Park. It was lovely lawns. There was settees with uh, picnic tables there. And uh, it was a very nice neighborhood. But then there was a uh, leather shop moved in. And uh, next door where that automobile junkyard is now was a playground in the park. It was a very, very nice neighborhood. But well, it's, when you married Marguerite, you moved to School Street, Gold Hill. 15 schools. And you've been here ever since. Yes. Uh, what was, this was predominantly an Irish uh, Oh, yeah. Community. Yeah, there's uh, the Browns and the Johnstons and the Minigans and the uh, Welches. The was here. Yeah, and the Bresnahans, and the Callahans, and the Linehans, and the Hafees, and the Sullivans. So you felt quite comfortable? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I knew my Greek's father for a long time. And, in fact, my grandfather knew my Greek's father in Ireland. They were both competitors in, in what we call uh, track, track teams now, running, jumping, pole wall, javelin, all that type of... Uh, sports, which is very popular in Ireland, even today. One of the Condon's neighbors, Helen Kuig, whose family has lived on Porter Street since the 1870s, claims that the name Goat Hill came from Mrs. Nanny Goat Shaw, whose goats resided on Summit Avenue. Helen, whose sister and four brothers grew up on the hill, has lived in the Kuig family home for 84 years. John, her oldest brother, served as Beverly's city clerk in the 1970s and remained a key figure in the political scene. Like the Kuigs, Mrs. Josephine Andreas was another lifelong resident of the hill and a neighbor of the Condons. I was born and brought up on Porter Street. 1910. I was born in 1910 on Porter Street, number 10 Porter Street. And my mother and father were Italian immigrants. And my father came when he was only 15, maybe younger. When did he come to Beverly? Oh, he didn't come to Beverly till he was uh, 22 years old. And by that time, he was married to my mother. They got married over in St. James's Church in Salem. And um, he, was a sh he got into the shoe factories through my mother's sister. She worked in the shoe factory, her husband too. And they got him a job, and he was a lining cutter. And he made $7 a week, and he married my mother. And then he had uh, three children still making $7 a week. And by that time, he moved to Beverly because the shoe factories in Beverly were paying more money. And we lived in a place they call a beehive. 
and there was three rooms, and I'm, I bet there was 15 families in there. Where is the beehive? It was on Porter Street. Still on Porter still Street. I'm there. still on Porter Street. So anyway, uh, then he got promoted to um, foreman of the shoe factory where, where he was working, and he got $10 a week. That's a long time ago, $10 a week. Now, what shoe factory would that be? Uh, Woodbury Shoe Factory. Woodbury? Yeah. And where was that located? Uh, I think it was the one that just burnt down. Awesome. The one right by the Edward School? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember a lot of shoe factories on Beverly and so? Oh, yes. In fact, I was only 14 when I worked in one, alongside of my father, and he'd take my pay. <laughs> on payday, they wouldn't hand me the pay. They'd hand it to my father. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? Which factory was it? That was in Bartlett's factory. <laughs> where, where was that located? The same, the one that just burned okay. down. He was way up on the third floor. Yeah. So you worked there at 14? At 14. So did, yeah. you, get drunk? did you get out of school to work there? No, vacations. Vacations, vacations no. By the time I was 17, I was working for uh, Matt Hayes' aunt, Man Kelleher. She was head of the stitching room. And she lived, it was all one of this family thing and neighborly thing, you know. So she said to my father, she'd make more money in the vacation if she came with me, and I'd keep a good eye on her. Tell us about your mother. Oh, my mother was just a housewife, just a housewife. That's the hardest job of all. And uh, she raised seven kids. I was the uh, third one. My other sister died when I was in the seventh grade. And uh, I can't remember my mother doing anything but cooking and sewing and scrubbing. Josephine, of the Adnesio family, married Anthony Andreas from Park Street and raised seven children on the hill. Tony Andreas worked at the United Shoe for 42 years as a machinist and as foreman. The Andreases, Condons, and the Kuigs, along with many other families, share a deep sense of community with a variety of family-oriented activities. That's all I remember of uh, my own mother, because all she did was stay home and scrub floors and bake bread. Seems that she'd just get the bread out of the oven, and of course butter then was very cheap. And every one of us, Helen Coig and the whole of us, Phil and Dave and the whole of us would be there, and the Minigan kids, and she'd cut up the bread and, oh, just slap the butter on it, and then we'd wait till Mrs. Coig baked gingerbread and take the over to her house, and she'd have to bake about five extra gingerbreads to feed the whole. <laughs> now you can't give a kid a cookie because it costs so much, you know what I mean? But it was a, a cohesive neighborhood. Uh, in fact, in those days we started the Ward 2 Civic Association. Myself, Norm Clark, Tony Andreas, uh, Dinah Montoni, the Gillis brothers. Uh, and I, uh, I don't want to leave anyone out when you start naming names, but uh, there were Barbara Stewart's and uh, Norm Stewart and her sister and her husband. Uh, oh, who else was here? And that uh, Jack Carr. Jack Carr. Yeah. What year Dr. Carr's you start the, uh, father. When did you start the War II Civic Association? Probably around 1948-49 in there. We used to meet at the Edward School. What was the purpose of the uh, War II Association? Well, actually, we used to give the... Uh, the children in the neighborhood a, a, a cookout, a bonfire, and a street party every Fourth of July, night before the Fourth, night of the Fourth, would block off the, uh, street, the lower end of uh, Wellman Street, Porter Street, and uh, Weber Avenue, block the whole block off, and have uh, a disc DJ in those days play the records. And, and we thought it was a good idea, and it was too, because it kept all the children in the neighborhood. Even the teenagers gave them something to do. We fed them hot dogs, hamburgers, ice creams, soda, uh, Coke, you know, orangeade, root beer, that type of drinks. The most wonderful memory of my life 
is the park at Pleasant View. Uh, before Chick McLean put that big wall to help people, uh, you know, what was it, the WPA? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a rolling green hill yeah, that went right down. And when we were children, my Aunt Katie used to take us down. And a big deal was a family picnic sitting on the slope of the hill. But it was a wonderful, wonderful place to live. And it still is today. And there are many families who have generation after generation that have stayed on the hill. Tony Andreas Jr. shares a similar experience. A wonderful place to grow up. Everybody knew everybody. Looking back, I can see how diverse our cultures were. And we all seemed to get along, especially we children. There was a large group of Finns on the hill. And I can remember Mr. Clemola and Mrs. Salanus swimming in the Bass River every day of the year. We all thought they were crazy, but they lived well into their 90s, so maybe they weren't. It is still awfully cold when you have to walk over saltwater ice floes to go swimming. We would spend all day, every day, at the playground playing ball. I delivered papers all through the area for years and cannot remember having a bad experience. Papers were only two cents, and then 12 cents a week. And some people had a hard time coming up with the money. But sooner or later, I always get paid. Good thing, too, because I needed the money for my room and board. Coming back after all these years away and seeing the same homes and faces gives a constancy to my life that cannot be found here in California, where we are constantly moving around like gypsies. Goat Hill is a special place and will always have a special place in my heart. It's a, it's a very close-knit neighborhood down on the hill. And I mean, uh, when there were holidays, uh, everybody had a family picnic in the yard. And you were as welcome to go from one yard to the other. And then... Uh, so you really didn't sense uh Ethnic uh, never, tension? Never, never. And the Gillises were there. Now the Gillises, Hinky and Ernie and Buster, they were all killed in the service. Wow. Yeah. So, Pleasant View, the park down here is known as Gillis Park. Marguerite, how many children do you have? I had five children. Uh, I had Patricia, Suzanne, and John, who is now deceased and uh, my daughter Julie, and my son Christopher. Oh, here comes Chris right now with my, Hi, this is my youngest grandson, Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, there you go. Oh, boy. <laughs> so How important has uh, your religion been to you and Jake and your family? Oh, if I didn't have my faith, mm. I truly, because my son was killed at night, the same night that my grandson Patrick was baptized that day. And, uh, you know, I've always tried to instill yeah. that faith. Uh, that's one thing I always said from my dad. Uh, my father had a really, really outstanding faith. And he liked his independence. He was an independent Irishman. But he lived with us for a while and then and it was before Jake and I had children, and uh, then he went and got a little apartment. And I can always remember, I went up every day, and I found a little pillow on his bedroom floor one day, about this big. I didn't know where it came from, so I just put it up in the shelf. So my father said to me, Margaret, did you see a little pillow on the, in my bedroom? And I said, yes. And he said, well, where is it? And I said, up on the shelf. He said, well, get it. And I said, well, it's so little, what's it for? And my father was 80 then, and my dad knelt down and said his prayers every single night before he went to bed.
good story as to how you came over and got hired at the show and you were already a machinist over in Salem. No, I worked for the factory while in Salem, but I knew how to run machines. Well, how did you learn how to run machines? Well, there was a fellow by the name of Patrick, and his, his daughter worked with Marguerite in uh, Sylvania for years, and he used to laugh because when I was 11 to 12 years old, there was a machine shop in the neighborhood called the Lock Steam Regulator Company. They made steam regulators. They're still in use today. They were patented, and uh, it was a small machine shop. They had their own foundry, and across the street was a Salem Brass Foundry, and Frank Hyde used to be over there, apparently, and I, I'm not sure of this, but they probably did contract work for the United Shoe, both places. And Mr. Hyde would be in and out there, and he used to see me, you know, when I was only a teenager and in high school, and uh, I went over there one day with uh, John Moran, who's a cousin of mine, who worked in a gun job over there before the war. I went in the Marine Corps. <coughs> he later became a patrolman at Salem and just retired a few years ago, but he went over there to get his job back under the GI Bill of Rights. And uh, I sat in the waiting room there, waiting for him to fill out his papers. And uh, one of the uh, secretaries there come out and said, uh, Mr. Hyde wants to see you upstairs. And you know, in those days, you had a lot of respect for anyone who was elder, older than you were. And so I said to myself, you know, what would he want me for? So when I went upstairs, I was ushered into his office. and. Uh, he said, uh, where do you work? I said, I work for the uh, Park Department of the City of Salem. He said, what do you make? what's your salary? So I told him what it was. He said, well, you could make easily double that here. And I said, now, now I'm becoming interested. He said, uh, you can go to work tomorrow morning in the foundry. And I looked him straight in the eye, and being young and single and, and not didn't want to be too fresh, I said, I wouldn't work in a foundry for $100 an hour. And I was telling him the truth. He said, well, you can get on a B1. And I said, well, now do they lift their fixtures and jigs with chain falls down? And he said, yes, they do. I said, no, thank you. He said, well, go up to A2. You can work for Mickey Hanlon. He's a tough boss, but he's fair. So I went up there. There were light, light machines, uh, not real heavy industrial work. And I stayed there for 15 years, which is a long time, because if you work for Mickey Hanlon, unless you were very good, you didn't last very long. He was friendly with Harry Monroe, who was superintendent of the floors then, and Frank Hyde was downstairs, and Frank retired, and Roger Silsby took his job over. But uh, afterwards, I found, I became friendly with Alex Duchamp, who was active in the Veterans of Foreign Wars. That was his daughter that sent me upstairs to see uh, Mr. Hyde. So that's how I went to work in a shoe. So the first three years, I worked, worked nights, and uh, you know, machine work was old to me. It was old hat, and I did fairly well at it, very well, in fact. And uh, I stayed there, stayed there for 15 years. You were telling me that you doubled or tripled your income? Yeah, yeah. when I went to work in the shoe. But when I went to work in the post office, they took a $3,000 a year cut for three years, which was worth it to me. The pensions uh, in the federal government are a lot better than they were in the shoe. What shoe pensions are uh, uh, fair, and they're, they're they're steady, they can't fold up and uh, go out of business uh, because most of them are annuities. And the old people that set up the pension system uh, were good because the annuities are there forever as long as they live. What did you get paid at the shoe when you doubled or tripled your salary? You were telling me. I was this. getting, uh, I think I was getting about uh, $45 a week uh, for the park department in the city of Salem. and. Uh, I think my first, pay I know my first paycheck, nights, which was a 50 hour a week, uh, I walked out of there with $300 after taxes, which now, was good money in those days. That's Very good money. 46. Six, yeah. Uh, you've you're been in the Navy, you're getting out of the service, yeah. and, uh, and uh, that's pretty good income. It is, was yeah. good income. Yeah. Was the shoe a good place to work in terms of the people around you? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, we used to. Uh, have a, uh, an outing once a year. I'll never forget, uh, they set me up as the uh, bartender one year and told me to make some screwdrivers and not being a drinker. I didn't know what they were. They said, well, just mix vodka and orange juice together. So I mixed a quarter vodka and a quarter of orange juice and the first couple of guys said, gee, those are great. 
<laughs> but most of them only lasted till noontime. <laughs> and I found out later that you don't mix screwdrivers that way. <laughs> Describe Mickey Hanlon and Roger Silsby to me. Well, Mickey Hanlon was a tough boss. He was Another tough. Irishman? Yeah. He was about six foot four, a big beer of a man, and but very fair and very decent. And if you work for Mickey Hanlon, you made a good week's pay. He made sure that you did. Now, so, 50 hours a week, you were working overtime. Yeah. Yeah. But when I left there, when I left there in... Uh, what 1961 yeah, or so? Uh, no, when I left there, I was, make, uh, I was working a 68-hour week. I was working 12 hours a day and eight hours on Saturday. Okay. Because we were making Sparrow missiles for Raytheon. In fact, I think they still use Sparrow missiles. They've been modified many times. But it's a, uh, they're a funny uh, material to machine is stainless steel forgings. And they work hardened, which means if you make a cut on them, that cut is pretty well hard by the time you get through. And, and the only way you can make another cut on them is anneal them or send them through a heat process. So you have to cut them fast and cut them quick and you have to keep your tools sharp. You have to make sure you only make one cut on, on certain parts. They're very tricky. The tolerances are very close. Yeah. With a, a man with uh, five kids and uh, a family and working that kind of hours, uh, <laughs> that must have been difficult. It was, it was very difficult. I remember, but you the, know. The shoe machinery skills oh, yeah. must have been in great demand, right? Yes, they were, because uh, I know we made some uh, um, what are now tape, they call them tape machines for milling and drilling and boring and tapping. Uh, they were called Milwaukee Maddocks. We made parts for the Milwaukee milling machines there. And uh, they're a machine that makes parts for other machines. And they wanted us to go out to uh, uh, Milwaukee and work on those, some of us. And being young, you know, with the kids in school, you're kind of hesitant until one day I got what we call a small tool salesman, makes chucks and uh, collets and things of that type. And I said to him, they have two of these in Pratt & Whitney down in Hartford, Connecticut. What are they like? He says, well, the only way I can describe them to you is you can imagine yourself being sprayed with hot oil all day and someone shoveling aluminum chips at you. Hmm. So when the Milwaukee Miller man came back, I said, no, thank you. Tony Andreas worked at the show. Yeah, Tony. And we, is, just, we just heard from his daughter that he worked there from the 20s to the 70s. Yeah. yeah. Tony was uh, worked over in the uh, B2 on gear cutters, as I remember. And because uh, I worked in A2, which was the next building over. Tony's a hard working guy. In fact, they, uh, he constructed that house where his, his wife just passed away. She lived there till she died. There used to be a school there on that foundation. The Pleasant View School. Yeah, Pleasant View School. That looks right out on the playground. Yeah. And on the walk. Yeah. 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 Faces uh, Kernwood and Salem. Beautiful view. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tony worked over there for a good many years. Hard working man. Now, you were a strong union man. Yes, I was on the, uh, uh, I was a union steward for a good many years. Now, Tony Andreas was a union steward? Uh, in the he probably time. was at one time, yeah. but when I was active, he wasn't. He was a supervisor in a, a gear cutters, I believe it was, Ray or McNeil? cam cutters. Were you with Ray McNeil? Yeah, I was before Ray. Ray, uh, I was the uh, legislative agent before Ray was. Then Ray got in it afterwards. Harry Ball? Yeah, Harry. But I used to go up to the State House. Uh, generally, it was either I or both of us, uh, Wally uh, Burgess and myself. Then Ray went up after I got out of the shoe. Now, Ray also went into politics after you. Yeah, right? Ray was elected alderman one term. Ray was from this area, wasn't he? Yeah, board two, same seat I had. Ray had a strong, booming voice. Yes, he did. And active in the sports club? Yeah. And the a very strong union guy. The reason I was smiling, we had a Democratic city club in his backyard one, one day. And I was working in the post office, and I come by his house, because yeah, I knew Ray. I was, had a suit coat on and a necktie, and I walked in the yard, and his, uh, his daughter said to me, oh, come right in, Governor. And I thought she was pulling my leg, so she gave me a plate of fried chicken and potato salad or whatever it was, and uh, I went over in the corner, sat down, was talking to people there, and up 
supposed Governor Peabody with his two state troopers in the limo. <laughs> and Ray said to his daughter, Where's the governor's dinner? I just gave it to him. He's over there sitting down. He's a damn fool. That's Jake. <laughs> she didn't know the difference. Now, she Jake, she just passed away last year too. Poor Jake, girl. you were uh, uh, active in the credit union. For the yeah, there's uh, ten of us uh, got together. As myself and Ray and Harry Ball and Bert Hanlon, uh, Bruno Fratello, Wally Burgess. And again, I'm going to miss a few names. But they, they, we each chipped in $100, and we started with $1,000. And the reason that came about uh, was myself, I think Bert was on it, and one, uh, Andy McCants had the Veterans uh, Commission, a uh, committee in the, in the union. And people used to come up and say, gee, you know, I'm broke, and pay this uh, Friday, and I won't get paid till next Wednesday, and I need to borrow 100 bucks. So it came to a point where we lend them $100, they'd pay back $100. Lend them $200, pay back $200. Lend them $50, they would pay back. So finally, so we started a credit union. So we did. And when we went before the banking commissioners, we had a choice of being a federal credit union or a state chartered. Well, we picked the state because it gave you a little better leeway for investments. And the credit union eventually became so big that we had to hire offline computer systems from the State Street Bank. It cost us so much money, we decided to merge with the Metropolitan Credit Union in, in Chelsea, which we did. And when we merged with them, we had a total of around $780,000 uh, assets in the credit union, which isn't bad for 20-odd years, uh, starting with $1,000.